Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about the training and test error of the ordinary least squares estimator. The prerequisites for this material are mean squared error estimation, ordinary least squares, and uh, the coefficient analysis that we did on the ordinary least squares estimator. Okay, I'm going to start with a quick recap um, of some of the stuff we learned about, about regression and ordinary least squares. Um, first, the general problem of regression is that of estimating a response y from a fixed number of features. If we know the joint distribution between uh, the response y modeled as a random variable and the features x modeled as a random vector, then the best thing that we can do is to just use the conditional mean as an estimator for y, which basically means for the observed features, what is the average value of y? The problem is that uh, the conditional mean is impossible to estimate from a finite number of data um, when the features are not very, very few. Okay, like when the features are more than a few, then it becomes computationally intractable because you, you need uh, unfeasibly large volumes of data to, to estimate this. We talked about this. This is basically the curse of dimensionality. Because of that, we need additional constraints on our models and making the models linear makes them quite interpretable and is often very effective in practice. So that's what we're going to talk about, linear models for regression. We already introduced the ordinary least squares estimator, which basically is an estimator that is obtained by minimizing the difference between the squared difference between the response and the linear model is summed up over uh, training data. So here, these are training examples where we have an example of the response and the corresponding features, uh, n of those, n examples. We're assuming everything is centered, which is why you don't see a constant in the linear model. So we already talked about what happens when the data are indeed generated by a linear model. So here, you can see that the response is equal to the inner product of the features with some fixed true vector of coefficients. Of course, this will never be the case in practice, but it's a very useful model that can approximate what you see in practical settings, as we will see later on, quite well. And we have this additive noise that we assume is Gaussian and has a certain standard deviation sigma. We already analyzed this um, in the video and the notes on Mean squared, estimation, mean squared estimation, and we saw that if you do linear regression uh, while knowing the joint distribution, so you know perfectly the covariance of the features and the cross covariance between the features and the response, if you know that perfectly, then you're going to achieve an error of sigma, which is as good as it gets because this z here is uh, independent from the features. So there's no way you're going to be able to estimate that component of the response from the features. The best you can do uh, is an error uh, of standard deviation sigma. Okay. The thing is that in reality, we do not have access to the true distribution. We only have access to um, n examples and that's it. Okay. We do not know the true uh, statistics, the true covariance matrix of X. We do not know the cross covariance between X and Y. We can only estimate them from data. And that's going to be the focus of this video, trying to characterize the training and test set when we're estimating, when we're taking into account that we're using a, tr a finite training set to estimate, to, to produce the ordinary least squares estimator. Okay, so to motivate this, uh, let's go back to this example where we had we wanted to predict the, temp the temperature in Yosemite. So the response is the temperature in Yosemite and the features are the temperatures in 133 other stations at that particular time. Okay, we're trying to find a linear combination of these temperatures that gives us the temperature in Yosemite. So here I'm going to show you again what we observed. We observed that here's the number of data that we're using to train the model. When we don't have a lot of data, we see small training error and large test error. When we have uh, more data, 
the training and test error are very similar. So the goal in this video is going to be to characterize this, to understand why this happens. In order to do that, we're going to consider a different model to the one I just said. Uh, in this new model, well, it's not new because we already analyzed this model for the coefficient estimate. So um, in this model, we have that we still have um, random noise, but now uh, we are basically not, not modeling just the response, we're modeling the response at training time, and then we'll also model the response at test. But for now we're going to focus on, on training, because in, in this first part we're going to analyze the training error. So the training data are modeled as a vector of n, a random vector with n entries. Each of the n entries is obtained by applying one of the feature vectors that are in the rows of x to the coefficients and then adding up the noise and the noise are just n iid uh, gaussian uh, it's iid gaussian so it's uh, n iid um, gaussian samples with uh, with zero mean and, and variance of sigma squared okay it's important to um, to emphasize that the coefficients are deterministic and here we're also modeling the feature matrix as deterministic, as opposed to before when we were we had like a, a random distribution over the, the features, where we weren't distinguishing between training data and test data. Okay, so we already did uh, some analysis on this model, and we found out that in, uh, if we have this model the ordinary least squares coefficients are equal to the true coefficient plus a term that depends on the noise and it's basically the pseudo inverse of the feature matrix applied to the noise so if if we assume if we make the probabilistic assumptions um, that i just described then this vector this error vector is a gaussian vector oh no sorry actually the whole vector so this vector here is a Gaussian vector where uh, its mean is equal to this because this guy has zero mean and its covariance matrix when you compute it basically is uh, u which is an orthogonal matrix a, a diagonal matrix with squares one over the singular values and another orthogonal matrix this basically means that in the directions where in the direction of the singular vectors for which the singular values are very very small the variance is one over the square of the, the square of those singular values so the variance is really really large in those directions okay the error can explode in directions where the singular value is very very small and now we can ask sure the coefficients actually explode because of this error but what happens to the response as I, and as we'll see um, it's kind of tricky because the response does not necessarily explode Okay, so first, as I said, we're going to focus on the training error and then we'll go, uh, we will analyze the test error. In order to analyze the, to study the training error, we're going to look at the ordinary least squares from a geometric perspective or a linear algebraic perspective. So here we have the linear model and remember that everything is centered so we don't have to um, take into account constant terms. And this is the linear model um, for an arbitrary beta okay so the way we choose our model is we change beta and that um, that's what determines our model uh, as you can see here the um, these are the data that are in the in the in the feature matrix each row here corresponds to a, one of the um, one of the examples that we have in the data set and each column each column uh, corresponds to one of the features. So it's the NF samples for feature one. These are the, oh, sorry, no. Yes, these are the N examples for feature one. These are the N examples for feature two, and so on and so forth, okay? Um, when we look at this from a linear algebraic perspective, we can express the linear model as a linear combination of 
these rows, uh, sorry, these columns, which are the rows of x, because we have x transpose t. So the first row again contains all the examples of feature one, the second row, all the examples of feature two, up to the pth row that contains um, the n examples of feature p. Those get weighted by the corresponding coefficient. So if you think about it, this linear model that we're fitting, you can see it as a linear combination of these vectors, and hence it lives in a subspace. So now I'm going to show you an example. So try to imagine an example where you have that n is equal to 3 and p is equal to 2. Okay? In that case, this matrix would be would basically have two columns because x would have two rows and three um, and there would be three examples so what this is saying is that you would have these two columns and your linear model would be a linear combination of those two columns so your linear model would live on a plane here oops well okay like this is what i'm calling the rows so now we're going to see an example where we have two of those and uh, n is equal to three. So they live in three dimensions. So what I was saying that is in that case, you're going to have a plane, a 2D plane living in three dimensions. Um, from the, I mean, in, in linear algebra, we call this a subspace. It's a plane that goes through the origin and it's a linear combination of a finite number of vectors. And here we have uh, the picture for the case where again n is equal to 3 and p is equal to 2 because n is equal to 3 we are in 3d because p is equal to 2 uh, when you do x transpose beta basically you have different linear combinations of the rows of x which are the columns of the transpose okay this is these two guys and you get that every possible value is in this in this 2d plane okay these are all the possible values that um, that the linear model can take so now we can go back and think about the ordinary least squares estimate for the response and the ordinary least squares estimate for the response is basically taking y train and saying okay if i do x1 times beta 1 plus x2 times beta 2 how can i get you know closer Okay, you, you basically minimize these two coefficients so that you're the closest possible to where I train. So that means that you're looking for the point here that is as close as possible to Y train. That point, as you know from linear algebra, is just the projection of the training response onto the subspace spanned by these columns, uh, uh, well, by these rows of the feature matrix, okay, or columns of the transpose. This gives us a very nice geometric perspective over ordinary least squares can, that uh, allows us to um, study the training error. Okay, so what is the training error? It's just the training response that we observe minus x transpose applied to these coefficients that are the ordinary least squares coefficients. So now we know that this is nothing but the projection of the response on the row space of X. And now remember that we have a linear, like we're assuming an additive model where the response is equal to X transpose beta true plus Z train. That's what the response is equal to. Um, now we're going to have to subtract the projection of that onto the row space of X. Okay, so now you're going to tell me is this guy in the row space of X? Think about it for a moment. You can stop the video if you need time to think about it. The answer is no, this is just a random vector in N dimensions, so it's pointing basically in a random direction. And now let me ask you again, is this guy in the row space of X? Think about it for a moment. And indeed it is because, um, again, every time I ask a question, feel free to just stop the video Actually, I recommend that you stop the video and you think a little bit about it. So this guy is definitely in the row 
space of x almost by definition because it's equal to x transpose times um, some coefficient so it again as we said before this is just a linear combination of the rows of x because this guy is in the row of x uh, uh, sorry in the row space of x its projection onto the row space is just equal to this so it's going to cancel so these two guys are going to cancel because of that and what we end up with is okay here I've, I've done this extra step this is going to cancel as i was saying so we end up with z train minus its projection onto the row space of x that's by definition equal to the projection of z train onto the subspace that is orthogonal to the row space of x so in our example in our very simple 3d example that would be equal to i mean it, the projection onto this line that is orthogonal to this um, to this subspace it's a 1d line in this case okay so now we have this nice expression for the um, the training error it's a projection of a gaussian random vector of dimension n onto this subspace um, that is the complement of the row space of x because x has p uh, rows this subspace has dimension think about it n minus p okay because the dimension of a subspace plus the dimension of the complement always gives you the dimension of the ambient space and in this case the ambient space has dimension n okay so now what we want to do is we want to characterize the average training error so we, we, we we're going to try to compute the expected value of the training error as we have just seen the training error is just equal to the um, projection of uh, the noise onto this n minus p dimensional subspace we're going to divide by n to to again average by the number of training data okay so as i just said this requires studying the projection of an iid vector on a subspace so in rn like if so if you remember like well if you remember we're assuming that the gaussian vector has a covariance matrix the identity which means essentially that it's pointing in every direction with the same uh, with the same probability basically it's it's spherical it doesn't have more variance in one direction than in another so the question here is what fraction of variance do you think is going to be captured by a subspace of dimension n minus p and intuitively what we might expect so that looks a bit subspace of dimension n minus p uh, intuitively what we might expect is that the the variance captured by a subspace of dimension n minus p would be n minus p over n because we have n dimensions we're looking at what how much of of this random vector is in a subspace of dimension n minus p okay this is completely heuristic what i just said but we can prove that this is essentially the case in order to do that we'll have to look at uh, the behavior of um, Gaussian random vectors um, and we'll see why so okay the projection of z train so first we have to okay, what I meant is this first we have to see what this is the projection of a Gaussian random vector onto a subspace and after that we'll be able to determine what fraction of variance is captured so what is this this guy we can write it as z train and then a projection matrix applied to z train this projection matrix essentially just has um, n minus p orthonormal vectors that belong to the subspace that we're projecting onto because remember that the subspace we're projecting onto has dimension n minus p if we expand this uh, squared norm okay we basically have here the inner product between this matrix that has n minus p so basically it looks like this okay n minus p orthonormal rows this is n times it's uh it sorry sorry like v transpose v because these rows are orth orthonormal because this matrix has orthonormal columns this is just equal to the identity okay so we end up with uh, that this is the identity so it disappears we have the L2 norm of V transpose Z train, where again V transpose has 
um, n minus p rows of dimension n that are orthonormal. Now we want to characterize um, the L2 norm square of this vector. Realize that this is a linear transformation of a Gaussian random vector. Okay, and it turns out that um, this is an n minus p vector because we have a matrix applied to a to a vector again like v transpose is n minus p times n so when we apply to c train which has dimension n we end up with a vector of dimension n minus p and remember that when we apply a linear transformation to a gaussian random vector it's going to have a mean equal to the linear transformation applied to the mean in this case it's zero and the way we obtain the covariance matrix is multiplying by the transformation on both sides now here we have iid gaussian noise so the covariance of the noise is just the identity okay and now if we look at okay this is the identity times sigma squared of course because i had forgotten about the actual variance of the noise this sigma squared is going to come out and we're going to end up with v transpose v but this guy has n minus p orthonormal columns so this is just the identity so this is basically showing you that when we project a, ran a gaussian random vector onto a subspace we obtain a gaussian random vector on that subspace and if the covariance matrix of the original vector is the identity the new covariance matrix is also the identity okay times sigma squared which is the noise level so now if we want to characterize the um, the training error it's basically an n minus p dimensional gaussian random vector with this covariance matrix so now the question is how does that behave the l2 norm of that because we we want to know the l2 norm of um of the error okay so in order to do that we have to characterize the l2 norm of a d-dimensional uh, gaussian random vector we already did this in the blended lecture so i'm going to go a little bit quick over this but essentially this is just applying um, the independence assumptions between the entries of the gaussian vector and um, um, linearity of expectation all over the place that's essentially how we do this so now here i'm going to use this notation this w is just an arbitrary gaussian random vector in dimension d but we'll apply to the training error in a moment you want to know the expected value of the squared l2 norm of w basically what we do is we realize that this is just the sum of the squared entries we can apply linearity of expectation and now we have a sum of the expected value of squared gaussians that have variance one so it's just equal to d okay on average um, the squared l2 norm of a gaussian random vector in d dimensions is equal to d okay so here we're looking at a standard gaussian random vector uh, we're assuming that it has covariance the identity just to be clear and it's zero mean all right so now uh, we are going to look at the mean square because we're interested in how much does this guy deviate from its mean so its mean is equal to d how much does it deviate from its mean so remember that when we talked about this in the blended lecture what we said is oh in in one and two dimensions we realize that gaussian vectors are often around the origin what happens in guide in high dimensions are they also close to the origin and what we realized is that in high dimensions the l2 norm of these gaussian random vectors is equal to d and as we will see in a, as we will confirm in a moment uh, the norm actually concentrates around d which means that they're not close to the center they're more like on a shell um, with radius d around the origin okay so in order to establish that we need to determine what their variance is around their mean in order to do that we're going to compute the mean square here these calculations get a bit messy but basically we, we want the square of this of the um, um, of the sum of the squared entries we expand uh, that sum and then we look at the cross terms and the terms for which i and j here are the same when i and j here are the same we get the expected value of the um, 
of the fourth power of the entry of, of a Gaussian variable that happens to be equal to three. Okay, you can either do this numerically or look it up. Um, and then in these cross terms, like these guys are just going to be equal to one because the variances are one. So you have to see how many cross terms you have there. And when you put everything together, you end up with 3d here because of this is equal to three. And here d times d minus one because that's the number of cross terms. The conclusion here is that the mean square is equal to d times d plus two which means that when you compute the variance, which is the mean square minus the square of the mean, and remember that this guy, the mean, is equal to d, you end up with a variance of 2d. So a um, standard deviation of square root of 2d. When you compare this to the mean, the ratio between the standard deviation and the mean um, if you do a ratio between the standard deviation and the mean, you realize that the standard deviation around the mean is getting smaller and smaller and smaller as d grows. Okay, so basically um, that ratio scales as one over square root of d. Essentially, what happens is that the square delta to normal concentrates around d as d grows. So for high-dimensional random Gaussian random vectors, we have that the mean. Um, the L2 norm, sorry, so you have to take a square root of the squared L2 norm, is uh, basically the square root of the dimension. Again, we saw this in the blended lecture, if you remember, but I just wanted to review it because it's relevant um, for computing the training error here. So then, because the training error was uh, the L2 norm of, um, of a projection to a subspace, now you need to remember what the dimension of that subspace was, and the dimension of that subspace was n minus p. So now this is going to be equal to n minus p, and that's going to be the expected value of the squared error. And we know that it concentrates as long as n minus p is not too small, and in general it's not going to be too small. So basically we end up with a training error when we take a square root of sigma, which is the noise level, times 1 minus a p over n, because this, remember, was n minus p over n. Okay, so now we take a step back and we think, okay, what's going on here? What is this telling us? So first, what happens when p is much smaller than n? Then the error is equal to the noise. So we get a similar result to what we had seen when you know the full distributions. The error that we we're getting was sigma, which is what you would expect, because that's the standard deviation of the noise. Now something very interesting happens when n is more, is more or less equal to p. In that case, the error is very, very small, right? Like this can almost cancel, you get very, very small error. And now I really want you to stop the video and ask yourself, is this good? Like, are we in a good situation here? Is this good news that we have small error? Because a small error kind of sounds like, oh, you know, this must be good. So take a, take a moment to think about it. And the answer is that this is really bad news, because as I said before, you're, we're assuming that we have this additive term that is completely independent from the features. And here somehow our model is able to have a, um, um, an error that is much smaller. This has to mean that our model is fitting the noise in the training data which is really, really bad, because then when we have new data coming in, this is not going to generalize. Okay, The extreme case is when p is equal to n, we have zero error here. And that actually makes sense, right? Because if you think of y train equals x transpose b, uh, I mean, that's what we're trying to fit, right? In the case where uh, n is equal to p, this guy is a square matrix. So of course we can invert it, to find coefficients that perfectly fit the training data. But of course, that's a horrible thing to do because you know that you cannot exactly fit your training data. So you're going to overfit a lot. And here I'm showing the, um, the graph of the training and tester. So we'll talk about the tester later, but let's focus on the training error here, which basically is this part here. Okay. So let's focus on the training error. Um, the point which I have just mentioned where the number of features is the same as the number of data points is here. And indeed we see zero, I'm gonna change the color, 
we indeed see zero training error there. And here, um, using this orange line, I'm showing the prediction for the training error that comes out of our analysis on the linear model. And perhaps surprisingly, I was definitely surprised when I saw this first, it, it produces an extremely good prediction even though our data are, are real data. So these are actual temperatures that were measured and uh, we're fitting a linear model to you know, the temperature of Yosemite using these other temperatures. There's no true linear underlying model, although this seems to show that um, there is a linear relationship between the temperatures of uh, these other places and Yosemite, the temperature of Yosemite, and the model inaccuracy or misfit or whatever can be well approximated uh, by, as, as additive, as additive and, um, and IID. So that's pretty cool. So notice that this sigma here is just estimated from the data as the point at uh, to which uh, this converges. And if you do that, you get a curve that really looks, um, you know, that really predicts the, um, the training error of ordinary least squares in this real world data set very, very well. Okay, but now let's worry about what's going on here. To start with, we see that the test error when our training error is really, really small is very large, which makes sense, right? Because again, we're, we're overfitting. Here, we're overfitting brutally. Now we're going to try to explain this curve um, theoretically. In order to do that, Okay, so this is, we're going to uh, study the test error now. In order to do that, we're going to maintain the same model for the training data. And now we need some kind of model for the test data, right? Because we're making this distinction where we train with a set of data. And now we're going to try it on new data. And what we're going to assume is that we have a random set of features. Okay, so a single new test um, a test example, let's say, where the features and the response are random and the features, <clears throat> we're not going to make any assumptions on them for now, except that they're zero mean. We'll talk about, uh, you know, we'll talk about what their covariance could be like in a moment. And we're going to assume that we have uh, additive Gaussian noise that is, of course, independent with the noise that was observed in training and also independent of everything else, independent of the features. Okay, this is going to be our model for the test data. And the variance is the same variance as in the training set. Okay, so again, realize that there's no way we're going to be able to estimate this from uh, just observing the features. So this is what we observe at test time. We observe these features. No way we're going to be able to estimate this because they're independent. Okay, so now we're going to what we want to do is we want to characterize the mean square of the test error which is the test response minus the model where this guy has been determined from the training data this is super important because this is the whole point okay so we use this to determine beta ols the ordinary least squares estimator and then we apply it on the training data um, because of our model for the response, basically the error has two terms. We have um, the noise, the test noise, which we know we're not going to be able to fit. This is independent with everything else. And then we have an error in the coefficients that gets multiplied by the feature vector. Because these things are uh, independent and everything is zero mean, um, we can basically characterize the error that will attain as sigma squared plus whatever this variance looks like. So in particular, if we manage to estimate the coefficients exactly, we'll get a sigma squared, which is the best we can hope for, as we had said before. Okay, and this is what we achieve. We know if we have like a perfect estimate of the covariance matrix and the cross covariance, because this is what we computed when we did the mean squared error analysis. Okay, so now we're going to focus on this second term and see uh, what we can expect.
So in order to do that, we need to focus on the coefficient error. Okay, this is the coefficient error. And uh, we already computed what the coefficient error is, but let me remind you, we apply the pseudo inverse to y. If we assume that y has this form, what happens is basically that we get beta true, because here we have the inverse of xx transpose times xx transpose, so we get beta true, which cancels out with this beta true, and we end up with xx transpose uh, inverse times x times z train. Okay, so this guy is basically x, x transpose minus 1x. And when we apply uh, the singular value decomposition, this is just a pseudo inverse where, um, just to remind you, oh, actually you have it here. This is the SVD of x. Okay, so this is what um, the error looks like. And remember that is what we were saying that in the, in the coefficients, if they're small singular values, then that makes the error explode. Okay, and uh, you can expand this uh, by realizing that essentially what you have here is inner products between the, um, the training noise and each of the right, the left singular, let me get this right, the right singular uh, values, right? And uh, divided by SI which is what makes the error explode sometimes, and then multiply again by a left singular vector. Okay, so again, as we had said before, what's potentially very worrying is that this is going to make your error explode. And what's interesting is that we, if we look at the singular values of the feature matrix for the temperature data set, they're very small, but they're very small all over the place. And I don't know if you remember the graph, but we will see that when there's a lot of training data, uh, we don't observe that like the test error is very high. However, the singular values are still very small. So what's going on here? Okay, this might be a bit surprising. So what's, uh, in order to understand this, we're going to compute the mean square of the test error. Okay, so again, the test error is just the, co the coefficient error. And then we apply the feature vector. And here we're expanding, so this expression that we have found for the coefficient error. Okay, here uh, we're, applying, uh, we're applying x transpose test transpose to this. Okay, we're doing this inner product between this and this. And essentially what we get is the inner product between these left singular vectors and the um, the feature vector and then it's weighted by the inner product between the noise and the right singular vector and divided by si so now in order to analyze this we have a square here so what we're going to see is that the cross terms so you can expand this into a sum over i times a sum over j a bit like what we did for the mean square when we were up, uh, analyzing this uh, l2 norm the squared l2 norm of the gaussian vectors okay when you look at these cross terms have a, a, um, an i and a j. Because of independence, what happens here is that you expand this out, you end up with, um, okay, so realize that x transpose is independent with c train, so we can just put the expectations applied to those in um, specifically. So this is because when you have the expectation of a product, if things are independent, it becomes the product of expectations. What happens here is that we end up with this, which is just the covariance matrix of the noise, which we know is the identity. And that means that we end up with a product here between right singular vectors that are orthogonal. So this is just going to be equal to zero. Okay, so basically this means that we can uh, split this into the sum of the squares okay, and put the expectation inside because all the cross terms are zero. I know that this gets a little bit complicated. What I recommend is that you try to follow this through on your own uh, with, uh, you know, on paper. And if you have any questions, you just ask us. But it's obviously very difficult for me to reproduce every single little step um, uh, because, because, yeah, because it gets a little bit complicated. But please, please do ask us if you have any questions. Okay, so here what we've applied is, again, all the cross terms are zero. 
So now I can just basically take the sum of the squares. When I take a look again at the square of this, I realize that I have independence between C train and X, X test, so I can separate them like that. So it, you get the product of the expectations. And now we're going to take a look at this more carefully. Okay, so this is exactly the same, uh, except that we've uh, removed everything else, so that it's easy to see. So we've arrived at the fact that the uh, mean square of the error is equal to this. So now um, this we can just expand as this. Okay, why? Because when you take the square, this is just equal to V. Oops, sorry. The inside is equal to V transpose C, C transpose VI. And when you take the expectation of this, the expectation can come inside by linearity of expectation. And we know that the noise is IID, so this is just the identity. Okay. So, and then VI transpose VI is just equal to 1, so this is going to disappear. So we end up with, here we do exactly the same thing except that now here this is not the identity anymore it's just the covariance matrix of um, the features the test features so here we have that have ui transpose the covariance matrix of um, the test features times ui divided by the squared singular values sigma squared realize that this is nothing else than but the variance of the feature vector in the direction of ui Okay, that's what it is. And now we're summing over all the, um, the features. Okay, sorry, over, over P. Okay. And remember, by the way, that uh, there was this sigma square that comes from the first term in the error. Okay, so this was just the, the second part of the error. That first term, remember that we cannot do anything about it. So now we're worried because we see a squared singular value here again in the denominator and here we have the variance as i just said of the um, feature vector in the direction of ui the thing is that and our question is is this are these singular values so problematic because when we look at the real data it doesn't seem like they should be that problematic because the tester eventually converges uh, to what we think it should converge to and what we realize is that um, if you look at the sing squared singular values, the squared singular values at the end of the day uh, can be obtained as UI as basically, so here, just to make it clear maybe, this is just the L2 norm of, of SUTUI. So basically it's like applying the Actually, maybe this is going to be a, like, let's start with here. So if we, if we think about what is, the, um, what is this equal to, which is obviously, okay, maybe let's start here. So this is just the variance, uh, the empirical variance of um, the features in the training set in the direction of UI, okay? Because this matrix here is the sample covariance matrix of the, um, the training set. If you expand it, okay, well, it's just equal to x, x transpose divided by n. If you expand it, what you get is x is equal to USVT, because this is the SVD. By definition, this is the SVD of x. The SVD of um, x transpose is V, oops, S U transpose. So this is just equal to U S squared U transpose. Where we did this kind of co uh, computations in the last class. Um, this is exactly what we get here. And now, if you do U transpose UI, it's all equal to zero except for the ith uh, row of U transpose. And that's going to get multiplied by SI squared. Okay. And the same here, where we've missed a, a transpose here. So actually, sorry, there's a, there's a transpose here missing. So basically, all I'm saying is that if you look at the... Um, at the sample variance of the feature vector in the training set in the direction of UI, it's actually exactly equal to the square of, um, the, of, that, of the corresponding singular value. 
which means that when I look at this, if so, here, okay, so if this happens to be more or less equal to the variance in training, okay, in the in like what we have written here as PUI, if this is more or less PUI x, the variance in training. So if the variance in training is more or less similar to the variance uh, during test, then in that case, this is just going to be one so that we have, oh, actually, I forgot to say something. Okay, there's an N here, okay? So we can multiply and divide by N. And now SI squared over N is more or less the variance during training. And this is the variance at test. So if the variance during training and the variance at test are similar, then this should be equal to, more or less equal to, 1 over n, and there's p of them. So then this is more or less equal to p over n. Okay. If it's true that the variance observed during training is similar to the variance that we're going to encounter in that direction during test. Okay. This will only happen again if the training, the variance estimated from the training data is more or less equal to the test variance in every direction. That happens when the covariance matrix, the sample covariance matrix in the training is a, a good approximation to the, to the covariance matrix of the test data. And, um, you know, this is not surprising because that's exactly what we're looking at when we're doing mean squared error estimation. When we're doing mean squared error estimation, we were assuming that we would be able to estimate all the statistics perfectly. And if that happens, then essentially we recover an error that is basically equal to sigma squared as long as n is large enough, right? So there's this error here. Um, because we need n to be large enough so that um, the covariance matrix is perfectly estimated. Let's put it like this. So interestingly, if we have enough training data so that the variance in every direction is well estimated from the training, even if we have small singular values, still the test error is going to be controlled. And we expect this dependence between n and the test error. And when we look at the results, we see that indeed, when n is relatively large, we get good, uh, maybe I'll use green, we get a good approximation, a good prediction. When n is small, here what's happening is that the covariance matrix from the training set does not provide a good estimate of the variance uh, of the test uh, data in, in every direction. And that's why this allows the error to explode because of these coefficients that explode. Okay, so in that case, it is very problematic that we have small singular values because the coefficient error explodes and it explodes in directions where the, tr the test error does not necessarily have small variance. Because at the end of the day, realize that we're saying here, when we're saying that these things cancel out, is that, okay, sure, you can, like, if you go back to your, like, I'm going to go right back um, to just the expression of the of the error so here okay uh, basically what we're saying is like okay this guy can explode in some directions it can be really become really large in some directions but that's okay as long as that guy as like the features do not have a lot of variance in those directions if the variance in those directions is really small then it's going to be fine things are going to cancel out and you're not going to have a lot of error uh, in the in the response you'll have a lot of error in the coefficient error but in the coefficient but not a lot in the response and this is what all of this derivation is essentially showing you that at the end of the day because the variance of the test of the features the test features in that direction are also equal to the singular value squared there's this cancellation and if you don't have a lot of variance in those directions then you're going to be fine what happens here Sorry, let me reach there again. What happens here? What happens here is that because um, the feature, the covariance matrix during training is not a good approximation to the covariance matrix at test, you do have um, coefficient error in directions where 
the, um, the test data does have significant variance and that's where your response error explodes. Okay, so this is how we explain this graph. Uh, so let's take a step back. What have we learned? We have learned that fitting a linear regression model can be interpreted of a, uh, in terms of a projection onto a subspace. And this allows us to characterize the training error very precisely, at least for the example that I showed you. And in general, it gives us a, a very uh, useful connection between the number of data and the training error that essentially reveals that we get severe overfitting if we don't have enough data. Um, and then we saw that the test error can actually be low even if the coefficient error is high, which sounds strange at first. And that's because the coefficient error will be high in directions where the, um, the feature vectors at test time will be small as long as we have accurately estimated the covariance matrix of the features during training. Thank you very much.